Good morning, everybody. Um, thanks very much for, for joining us at the Senior Housing and Healthcare Investment Briefing. Um, my name's Richard Betts. We've got a super panel for you this morning. Um, and this is an area that's been particularly interesting. We've been covering it for, uh, for a little while. We did the first session on the sort of senior housing and healthcare side around two years ago. Um, and it's really been a sector that's been growing. And uh, my sense, um, and I'll be interested to hear what the, the speakers have to say about this and also what your views are. Um, my sense is that um, there's actually going to be quite a significant um, amount of interest into, into this sector um, going forward simply because of um, how it's been, in, been highlighted by the current crisis. Um, in case you don't know um, who we are, um, just to let you know that Real Asset Media um, and Real Asset Investment Briefings, we have a series of channels, events, newsletters, magazines, TV. Um, and one of the things that we're also um, launching today um, is the Senior Housing and Healthcare Association, um, which is an initiative built by the industry um, just to come together, particularly around these, um, have a shared voice and also drive more transparency and more information into the market for investors in, in general. Um, we run a series of magazines, but I won't focus on those. Um, we've launched a whole new series of initiatives since the crisis to keep everybody connected, including special reports. You can download the coronavirus impact on real estate one for free off our website. Realcast, which is a weekly analysis of the key themes. Um, that's every Monday. Um, Real Asset Live events. We'll be looking to do kind of 50 or 60 of these over the year, just as we used to do for, for physical events. Um, and last but not least, um, we're launching as well um, a new initiative called uh, RealX. Um, Global, which is a virtual exhibition conference, um, which starts on the 17th and 18th of September, um, but is going to also last all year. So it'll be the the exhibition will be open all year, and it'll use um, augmented reality, uh, holographic technology, and um, to enable you to do things that you wouldn't be able to do um, in a in a physical um, exhibition. Um, but more on that later. Um, so. First of all, um, what I want to do is is just introduce the panel. Um, so we have uh, Frederick Dibb uh, from Mosaic Asset Management. We have Keith Harris from CBRE. We have Gert Villens from Trigrinta Real Estate. Um, Keith Zacharias uh, from Cofinimo. And last but not least, uh, Ron Van Bluis from, from Havo. Um, uh, but what I'd like to do is, uh, is maybe just just to start with, um, and let's, let's start with you, um, Frederick. Um, if you just uh, just briefly introduce yourself and your company so that then everybody knows kind of where you're coming from in, in this discussion. Of course. Thank you, Richard. Hello, everybody. I am Frederick Dibb, president of Mosaic Asset Management. It is in Paris. Um, we are a specialized um, asset manager, uh, specialized in healthcare, having invested over 250 million uh, um, over the last uh, three years now, uh, across four geographies, uh, France, Germany, Italy, Spain, um, mostly nursing homes and rehab clinics, um, nurseries and medical office. And looking to do much more of it um, this year and expanding into more geographies as well. Okay, super. Um, let's come to you, Keith. Uh, Managing Director of Cofinimo in the Netherlands. I started this job March 1st, so it's a virtual job. I've never been in the office uh, yet. Cofinimo is a very large uh, stock exchange listed uh, real estate fund in Belgium, a total of about 4.5 billion in assets, of which 2.5 billion in healthcare assets, spread uh, over Belgium, Germany, France, Spain, and the Netherlands. In the Netherlands, we have about uh, 300 million in assets at the moment. Uh, we have another about 100 million to be invested this year. And we have a very strong expansion strategy. And my background is uh, with Arthur Anderson and Deloitte. Before I joined Cofinimo, I was over 30 years with uh, these firms in audit, corporate finance, and in real estate. Perfect. That's great. Thank you. Geert? My name is Geert Wellens. I launched two years ago uh, a real estate company called Treginta. Treginta is funded by a number of Belgian families and is engaging in three specific domains of the real estate market that are maybe a bit less known uh, right now, but uh, uh, created a number of possibilities, I guess, for the coming years and the coming decades even. So 
We're active in the redevelopment of religious sites, religious buildings, in a respectful way. What we try to do is bring functions in those buildings and those sites that uh, make a link to what historically they were used for. That's uh, the first domain. Secondly, we try to build and finance the care infrastructure of the future. And this care infrastructure will be largely different of what it is today. And when I talk about care, it's larger than elderly care. It's care as a, as a whole. And we try to engage in private and public partnerships. We try to help local authorities, communities, uh, cities to develop their infrastructure. Uh, we try to build it for them. And we're talking about schools, uh, libraries, uh, cultural houses, and things like that. And give them the possibility to rent them uh, over a longer uh, period. So these are the three domains we're active in. Great. Thanks very much. Keith. Uh, my name is Keith Harris. I'm an executive director at CBRE. Uh, I'm based in the operational real estate team uh, in London, covering the UK and, and uh, mainland Europe. Uh, operational real estate includes, among other things, uh, healthcare, healthcare real estate. Uh, and my uh, speciality is uh, all forms of healthcare, primary acute and senior living. Um, and primarily, I'm transactional, uh, mainly sell side, but also I have a, a buy side uh, side to the business as well. Super. Thanks very much. And last but not least, Ron. My name is Rohan Blois. I'm one of the four partners of Evo. Uh, we are a leading consultancy and project management and development company based in the Netherlands. Uh, it's a real pleasure to uh, give a short keynote uh, about healthcare investments and also launch the Senior Housing and Healthcare Association. Uh, let me introduce myself briefly. Um, I'm one of the four partners of Evo, uh, leading consultancy project management and development company based in the Netherlands, uh, and since 2012, I'm also a lecturer at the Amsterdam School of Real Estate. Uh, we are an academic institute for real estate science and postgraduate programs. Uh, and indeed, in the beginning of 2020, uh, we focused on, uh, we actually, we founded this Housing and Healthcare Association. So I'm quite proud to give a short presentation about it. And we are also joined by a beautiful group of founding members and industry leaders. Um, my purpose is to make impact in the build environment, uh, to teach approve activities regarding sustainability, finance, and alternative real assets. So uh, this event ticks all the boxes uh, for me uh, personally. Um, and before I will share some insights uh, regarding the unique drivers and uh, opportunities of healthcare real estate, I would like to emphasize my respect to the healthcare sector uh, because the impact of COVID-19 on the society is huge. And I think we've realized that being healthy and fall back on a professional healthcare uh, sector is uh, quite crucial. Um, so also my condolences to all affected people but also my uh, deepest respect to all social workers, nurses, and doctors. So actually, the main question of this keynote is, why is healthcare becoming a mature asset class for investors? Um, and I think it's actually a quite simple answer um, because the main driver is the aging demographics. And uh, these are key and quite impressive, especially the population growth, but also the number of diseases, for example, dementia, that the one on five persons uh, gets dementia uh, when they're getting older. Um, and we see uh, actually a new type of product, more residential product for self-sufficient elderly people. We call it the senior housing and senior living. On the other hand, we see the more specialized long-term care, more operational assets, uh, and they have a big investment uh, demand. It's caused by mainly outdated large-scale real estate portfolios. Uh, and when they have the Paris Agreement, they need a lot of cash and they don't have enough cash to uh, finance it through their balance sheet. Uh, and on the other hand, we see that real estate operators are aware of that they can attract customers to their business. And also maybe they can expand cross-border. 
On the other hand, on the other side of the spectrum, we see the more specialized cure. So the clinics, but also the medical office buildings, and we see a flow of uh, investments. So the result is a significant growth of the U European investment market. Now look at the investors uh, switch, because why are investors looking to the alternatives? They search for volume, diversification, but especially long-term cash flows and yields. And uh, I think it's good to know that healthcare investments are non-correlated to political tensions, but also the economic cycles. And I think COVID-19 also proves that healthcare real estate is a very interesting asset class. Uh, on the other hand, we see the more impact side, because when we would like to make impact, we look at ESG and the SDGs, and healthcare ticks all the boxes. And we see then that uh, we're getting from a niche asset class to a more mature market, uh, especially because of the growth in deal flow, and uh, we see an increase of tickets. So we, we're not talking only about assets, uh, more single asset deals, but we're also looking to portfolio deals. For example, Idifica in 2019, who did a deal of over 450 pounds in millions. So that's really interesting. And when we talk about deal flow, um, I think it's good to know that we see uh, a quite interesting explosion of deal flow uh, through the last years to uh, uh, countries, uh, for example, the UK and the Netherlands, uh, but when we look in total of Europe, we're talking about, for example, 7 billion of deal flow per year. So it's really interesting also for institutional investors. So why do we need an association? Uh, because in daily practice, uh, we see a lot of challenges, but also we experience shared purpose of both operators, investors, but also stakeholders like banks. And I think we've got a shared purpose for valuable people. And we would like to make state-of-the-art healthcare infrastructure to create a future-proof uh, global and local system. So why an association? I think we would like to drive the maturity of the senior housing and healthcare investment market in Europe. Um, and we see a lot of biased data. So. Uh, we, we, we would like to create independent data and also benchmarks. And uh, when we speak with operators and investors, uh, we notice a lot of confusion of tongues because we, we, we think we speak about the same in terms of nursing homes or senior housing, but let's determine definitions. And also we, we are looking for inspiration and knowledge, also cross-border. So we, we should share best practices on the European level. And talking about impact investing, we need to clarify the performance on ESG and the SDGs criteria. Uh, therefore, the idea to create a multi-stakeholder platform where the operator meets the investor and also stakeholders like banks. So talking about multiple impact, I think the, the main purpose of the association is to improve the quality of life of especially the aging population and also to, well, let's maximize the GDP and also create more deal flow. So we've launched a website and uh, this website highlights why we uh, launch it, how we do it and what we do. Uh, talking about membership, uh, you, you can, you, you, you can meet, be a member to uh, benchmark the data, which will be collected anonymously by the Amsterdam School of Real Estate, where we also do in-depth research, high quality with quarterly output and research papers. We will do networking, so maybe not only online, but also an annual conference to meet each other, and uh, especially creating a voice and the publication, it would be great to have a dedicated publication on this topic. Well, talking about founding members and industry leaders, I'm really proud to present uh, this group of founding members. And it's also good to know that we already have some full memberships like Rabobank Group who already joined us. But it's also possible for you to join as an individual or as a small company. So be a friend of the association. These are the guys uh, on the background of the association. So Richard, Thorsten, but also Leo, 
who is the general director of the Amsterdam School of Real Estate. So actually, um, we would invite you, all actually all purpose-driven parties to join and shape the association. Thank you very much for your time. Back to right, the Thanks panel. very much. Maybe just very briefly explain A, ESG and also SDG, um, just because I'm aware that we use quite a lot of these kind of terms, um, just to make sure that everybody understands exactly that from a, from a sort of impact perspective. Yeah. Well, maybe uh, to clarify the ESG, I think uh, investors are uh, looking for impact. So they define the environmental, social and governance perspective. So how can we make impact with our capital? And uh, the SDGs are the sustainability development goals of the United Nations. And actually we try to align the ESG with the SDGs. So how can we make impact also on a global level in terms of sustainability, employment, uh, etc. Perfect. That's great. And thanks very much for, for that, Ron. Really interesting. Maybe just coming first to you, um, Keith. I mean, there was already a real momentum um, behind this sector pre-crisis in in Europe. Um, I suppose, what do you what do you see as the as as the position now? Well, there's no doubt that the COVID nineteen crisis has adversely impacted the sector from a, an operational perspective, uh, increasing costs, declining occupancy, um, but the the fundamentals of the sector uh, remain. So we heard Ron talking about demographics. Um, in the UK, uh, the, the picture is that we have roughly 440,000 beds, and that number is declining every year, believe it or not, uh, only by a few hundred, but it's declining. Um, the beds that are leaving are, are the poorer quality beds, um, and there's a, 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 an increase of about 18,000 beds per annum, and they're good quality beds, but nonetheless, we need tens of thousands of new beds every year. So from a simple supply and demand perspective, um, the, the momentum is not going to change. And probably that momentum is going to, to remain in force well through 2035 and, and beyond, which is when the, the population voltages are really expected to peak. That's interesting. Um, and and what's, what's your sense, I suppose, um, Keith, just, What's your sense of this? You've been in the market for a long time, so have seen, a, a, you know, the global financial crisis and different things happening. Do you, I suppose, see this highlighting the industry much more and being potentially a turning point? I don't necessarily think it's a turning point. What we see is that it is a very uh, resilient uh, asset class. Um, the governments have come in with a lot of support, uh, as well as the health insurers in the Netherlands. I, I speak for the Netherlands only. So, uh, in spite of higher costs, in spite of uh, of some occupancy uh, problems, uh, all the organisations uh, will get sufficient support in Holland to survive. So, we think that um, that is not really a turning point. Maybe there will be a bit more attention to the future to. Uh, prepare more for this type of situations uh, because the especially nursing homes were completely overlooked in terms of, uh, of safety so they will maybe increase the cost of the business a little bit but um, all in all I think this um, it, it will just not be a major change in, in the Netherlands for the, for the industry. Okay, that's, that's interesting. And, and Frederick, what's what's your perception of it? I mean, I suppose, how is business at the moment for you? Because I know you're at the moment kind of on the road. Um, so what's what's your sense, I suppose, of, of where we were pre-crisis and, and where we are now? I suppose some of the, the short-term implications and influences and how you see it longer term. I think short term, of course, is really to bring... Um, to be closer to the operators and, and to try and, and uh, you know, be, be uh, comprehensive and, and understanding of, of, of what, what they have been through. I think it's actually mostly from a maybe a human perspective because, you know, they have taken a toll on, on their morale, on, on the morale of the staff. Um, from a financial perspective, um, it, you know, it has... has it has had some effect, of course, but I think 
um, given the image and, and the feeling that everybody has got, you know, that it has been a very traumatic and it's a drama from a human toll perspective, from a financial perspective, you know, it has been relatively limited. Uh, we have had relatively few, uh, little demands for rent reduction or, or, or franchise or, you know, rent free period or whatever. Um, and um, I think the, the short term focus uh, is really potential, um, you know, regulatory um, scrutiny, increased scrutiny, short and medium term. Um, and uh, and I think longer term, this increased scrutiny will um, increase the, the speed of consolidation. And uh, I think that the, I've talked about the human toll. When you are an, an independent uh, player um, and you have had to cope with this on your own, I think, um, you know, again, from a morale point of view, human perspective, personal perspective, you may want to say, well, actually, you know, I don't want to do that again. And it may uh, push you um, to, towards, you know, exiting the business. Uh, when you are a group, uh, I think it's, um, and that's what I'm hearing from, from a lot of, of the larger operator, uh, it may not be, be very uh, politically correct, but people are saying, you know, the, the, the independence is going to increase the speed at which independents are going to exit the, the, the business. And it's, so the market is, you know, the consolidation is going to increase in, in the market. So I think that's what I feel from the operators uh, saying, you know, the, the larger one really being on, of course, you know, um, uh, doing their, their own business and, 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 and organization and making sure that everything is right. But then immediately after that, focusing again on development, on consolidation, uh, and diverse, geographical diversification. That's it. I mean, it must have been a hugely challenging time, I, I think, for, I mean, certainly from my perspective sitting here in, in London, the, the challenges that have been seen in the UK market, and I'm sure have also been replicated um, across the rest of Europe. Um, I just wanted to pick up with you, um, again, just there's, there's been a question come in um, around financing just in terms of the, the, the financing side, but also some of the more general impact, wider impact of the health crisis in terms of um, what we expect to happen with uh, interest rates, what, what we're expecting to happen in terms of you know, economic recession, how those things, how do you see those potentially impacting this sector? Do you see it as more resilient than others? Well, I see indeed that the, every crisis, as uh, history has proven, every crisis is an accelerator for certain underlying trends that were already active and available. But uh, the crisis always accelerates these things. And as far as financing and economics are concerned, I think indeed uh, it has proven that the debt rate in not only in the, the healthcare sector, but also in other sectors is quite high. But governments and central banks uh, have shown a real conviction to fight this trend by creating new money, eh, by printing, printing money. So I think there, the sector uh, will be able to, to, to finance itself through uh, new means of uh, financing through the central banks. Other on the underlying uh, trends I see is indeed, as, as Keith said, the demographics are still strong. But I believe that uh, the generation that is now gradually coming to the elderly care facilities is the baby boom generation, and they have other expectations as far as luxury and technology is concerned of their elderly care uh, houses. Um, and uh, I also think that uh, there will be a change in uh, how hospitals are going to function and how the link will be created between hospitals and elderly care facilities. I think hospitals will become more like, uh, gradually over the years, more like institutions where people come and go. And the elderly care, the, the geriatric wards, will be, I guess, replaced by facilities in elderly care homes where the necessary care will be given to those people. Um, so those underlying trends are, well, as far as I'm concerned, are the, the, the bigger trends for the coming years. And the economic situation and the, the financing situation um, is 
an, uh, a point of interest, let's say, certainly, but might be resolved by the creation of new means uh, given to the sector by local governments and by central banks. Okay, good. Um, and, and Keith, I, I just wanted to, to pick up with you, um, just, just in terms of, of the debt side, um, you're obviously looking at it from, from many senses there at, at CBRE, um, but how are you seeing that in, 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 in terms of the market at, at the moment, um, looking particularly at the availability of, of debt for some of the, the players there? Debt from, from the um, mainstream lenders, the banks and non-banks, uh, is virtually non-existent right at this moment. Um, that's, that's for long-term uh, investment finance. Uh, ironically, the, the market that is pretty much open is the development finance market. Um, and the logic behind that is that whilst no one really knows quite how long this crisis is going to last, um, nobody is actually saying it's going to last forever. Um, and therefore, where you have developments coming uh, on stream in one or two years' time, the, th the thinking is that at that time, um, in, in the senior living space, the, the markets will be um, operating it, it, with much more efficiency and, and much more functionality. Therefore, if you're going to finance um, development, that, that is relatively um, capable of being underwritten, much as it has been in the, in the last five to ten years. Investment finance, on the other hand, um, where you're investing in real estate that is subject to, to leases, uh, one of the one of the um, questions earlier was: are, are operators going to become bankrupt? Um, there will be some. Those that those that get into difficulty in this crisis were probably already in some degree of dif difficulty before the crisis. Um, <clears throat> so this crisis is very much going to be an accelerator for them. But um, nonetheless, the the credit strength of operators will be um, damaged in in the short term and possibly even longer than that which is which is not good news if you're um if you're a lender because you want to underwrite the credit strength of a, of a tenant even if they're not the sponsor i mean that's interesting and, and keith may be coming to you i mean you mentioned there keith a, a question that had come in um, in the in the Q&A, um, which does link that, you know, one of the key issues that COVID has raised is the security of the operators. With occupancy dipping, what's the risk to operators going bankrupt, care homes closing on a large scale, which is an interesting point. I mean, Keith, what's, what's your perception of that um, more broadly in terms of, uh, in terms of the sector? Um, do you see that there is an issue with potentially operators um, who, who are going to struggle because of the challenges that, that they've had. What's your sense of that? There will definitely be some operators that uh, will have uh, problems, but it's, I think, mainly the, the very small operators, as I think uh, Frederick was also uh, pointing at. Because there, if you have uh, a little bit uh, dip in occupancy, that it's really hard in um, covering all the costs. All the larger groups, what we see, um, and all the public organizations are quite strong. And um, well, we as a, at the moment we don't see really big problems in continental Europe with the financial stability of the of the operators. Yeah, add and and, and go in the same direction. Um, I really think that we it's important to understand. Again, I made the point about this, the human toll and and what we are, we're seeing on the news every day, and and the fact that you know in most in a lot of countries half of the people who died unfortunately came from nursing homes and and of course i mean these are relatively big numbers but then i think we have to put things in perspective and and um uh, if i take france or, or even less so uh, germany or uh, uh, spain or italy or even the us um the numbers <clears throat> you know you are about 1.5 to 2 percent of the sort of uh, existing number of people who were in in nursing home if we're taking nursing home uh, and again maybe we should go back to what is healthcare and you know what are the, the pain um, uh, uh, sort of sub sub segment but but if we're talking nursing home and senior residents this is this is the case so we're talking two percent one point five to two percent of the population um, that means in in a, in a nursing home you know occupancy rate 
because also they have had to stop, uh, of course, um, for three months uh, recruiting new, new uh, residents. Um, maybe a drop of, you know, from zero in some cases to maybe 10%. Um, and so basically dropping from 98% occupation rate to maybe 88, 85% which is about, uh, you know, the, the sort of the uh, break-even position uh, of these homes is around uh, 80, 75, 80, 80%. So I think we that shows, for me, the resilience of, of that. And, and it's important to, and maybe the bankers also will take some time, I agree, but then they will come also to their senses in that there is what we have seen and what we have all felt uh, on you know the daily basis that this is a dramatic thing uh, and I've had also you know a lot of people around me knowing which sector I'm in calling me you know and saying oh you must be kind of bankrupt um, and, 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 and the actual reality uh, and, and the actual impact on, on, on financials which is however I mean quite uh, controlled for lack of other words and and uh, and i think we will see that in the results of, of the operators um yes there will be a small dip uh in in profitability but nowhere near any sort of fear for, for bankruptcy and again i'm talking about the established group um and and, and not you know like an independent of course you're an independent and you have uh, had a, a major uh, uh infection in in your nursing home it's a completely different story. Maybe Richard, Pardon? I can, because I totally agree with uh, Frederick. Uh, I think the uh, COVID-19 uh, proves that healthcare is actually the most vital sector of, of our society. So talking about risk of an investor, I think we especially have the, uh, the proof that uh, healthcare is, is more vital than ever so we see more and more governments who will do the 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 the, the back side of uh, the operator but and then we we should focus on the fundamentals because i think uh, i i would uh, invest one euro in healthcare and, and not do uh, uh, offices because we would like to work at home but the fundamentals of uh, the aging demographics they are key and they are quite impressive so i'm i'm totally not um, uh, afraid of the image risk of investors or that uh, there will be a, a giant bankruptcy uh, under uh, operators. So I think it's, 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 it's a real safe haven for investors. I, I agree with that, Ron. I think there's another dynamic um, which, which is that central governments are pumping unimaginable amounts of capital into their economies to prop up unemployment uh, and countries which are, are um, uh, sorry, and companies which are not able to trade at the moment. And that's going to put enormous strains on, on um, government budgets, central state budgets. And there will be a massive push, and we're already seeing this, a massive push by governments in, in virtually every country to get more private sector capital into the healthcare market. And one of the one of the most obvious ways to do that is through the real estate um, and at attracting institutional investment at very low uh, rates of, of um, yield. I totally agree with, with Richard and with Ron that uh, there will be a need for private capital to build the infrastructure of the, the care. But at the same time, I think there will be a, a societal bonus, as I call it, for the healthcare sector. So governments won't cut back on spending on healthcare uh, on the contrary, so there will be, I guess, society realizes that we um, have some sort of a debt towards the healthcare sector and healthcare workers, and I think there will be an additional financing of the healthcare sector, but not of the infrastructure. So there is a need for private capital to build the infrastructure, but the care itself will be financed, I guess, uh, by the governments uh, in the future. Okay, good. Um, uh, just, just one thing I wanted to pick up, um, Ron, with you. There were, there were a couple of questions. Can you explain the international aspiration, um, but especially the European yeah. one? Would like to understand how the association can cooperate, support and, and advise outside the UK uh, or Holland, um, e.g. Greece. 
um, for senior housing developers and operators. Thanks for that, um, Evangelos, um, located in Greece. Welcome. Um, yeah. I mean, just briefly, I mean, from, from my point of view, when, when we set this up, the idea was by calling it international, um, was also um, to make sure that this was for everybody to be able to share expertise um, across the border. And yeah. um, although a number of the, you know, there are a lot of Dutch, uh, Belgium, French operators, UK operators within this, but the idea is that this should be across all of the sectors. I mean, what, what's your sense of that in terms of the inclusion and also, I guess, reaching out also to potentially the US and Asia, Ron? Yeah, yeah, because I saw one of the other questions. There was a question, how can we make a bridge to Asia? Uh, well, I think it's, it's important to understand that, uh, for example, we've got Corian and we've got Idifica and Cofinimo. These are already pan-European players. So we're not only focused on Netherlands or UK, etc. Uh, I think it's, uh, the main purpose of the association is to also get inspired and to share knowledge. So uh i think it's quite interesting to for example for a french player to get inspired by the nordics or when you live at at greece well what can we learn from the the dutch healthcare system for example um, and indeed uh, when when i'm when i'm dreaming i would like to make a bridge to other continentals like asia and the us but uh of our, I think when you look at the US, of course, we've got REITs uh, who are already existing like 30 to 50 years, like Ventas, etc. Uh, these are big players and uh, they have a very mature uh, real estate investment market related to senior housing, but also more the, uh, the cure side with medical office buildings. So um, yeah, it would be awesome uh, uh, when uh, in two, uh, one or two years, the association can make a bridge on a global scale. But uh, let's start with the European uh, uh, scope. And, uh, and I'm also willing to uh, give introductions to other uh, continents, of course. Great, I'm just gonna share the results of the poll with everybody. Um, so it was, do you, do you think senior housing and healthcare will grow as a sector post-crisis? Yes, significant growth, 62%. Um, yes, but same growth levels. 38%, no, there'll be no change, 0%. Um, so thanks very much for, for sharing your, your views with that. Are we seeing more interest from that capital looking at Europe, but also what does Europe need to be able to do in order to be able to have a similar sector um, as, as you're looking at in the US? Does that require government support? Um, what, what's the situation there? It'll be interesting to get the different perspectives from, from you as speakers there. I'm happy to, to talk about the UK position, which is that the senior living space is, is reasonably well established, but out on what we call a for sale basis. So it's, it's um, got, op uh, got operators, people like Audley and, and, and um, Richmond Villages, where you can buy an apartment for, um, for on a 125 year lease and, and pay several hundred thousand pounds. And it's, it's quite expensive to, to obviously to, to enter a, a, a community like that. The, the, the uh, annual payments are relatively low, um, but then there's something called a deferred management fee so that when when the resident sells that asset or normally it's or very often it's the family that will will sell the asset uh, a fee of 10 15 percent is then paid to the owner of the facility uh, that's got some controversy around it but it's it's reasonably well established um, what is not well established but is just starting a, a couple of green shoots is the rental model where um, residents enter a, a retirement community it, it looks and feels very much like um, communities on the for sale model but in the, the difference is that the the, uh, the apartments are for rent um, and there are just two really that I'm aware of in this country one is called Birch Grove and one is called Hawthorns um, and that but we're talking uh, about a handful of assets and one of the reasons that that's uh, been the case is that it is relatively easy to finance the for sale model on a very efficient cash flow model, um, which has meant that if a developer has got a site for senior living, uh, he's going to make more money much quicker by developing for sale than he or she is by 
developing something which would sell into the institutional investment market. But that institutional investment market is waiting for the rental products because they, they're desperate to invest in the sector. Okay, good. Um, just just picking up on this point, because I think it's relevant to this discussion as well, is um, a question that's just come in. Is there's been growing investment in private care home sector across Europe, particularly by French and Belgium investors over the last few years. Why are there not the same levels of investor interest in new models of independent senior living for the present and coming generation of fitter, more active and independent seniors? The demographics are compelling, but activity muted. What, what's our sense of that? Do we agree with that? Or, 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 or are, are we looking at these kinds of new sectors um, for the sort of, I, I suppose, light touch care, as we might call it here in, in the UK for senior housing? There's certainly a, a trend in that direction, what we call in, in Belgium the lifelong living facilities. Those are apartments with uh, services and uh, a light touch of care that allow people to live there for a longer period before they enter the, the senior living facilities when they really become care dependent, let's say. So there is a, a new form of infrastructure developing and we see this trend, this trend certainly in, uh, in Belgium, yeah. Okay, good. Frederick, you and what we see in, um, I think mainly in Germany, is this, this whole new development in the, like the campus type uh, properties. We have the very uh, the, the, the assisted living, the very light uh, form of, uh, of care, and then also the, the nursing homes. But these days, people only spend like between 12 and 36 months in nursing homes. So if you have a combination of more light and more heavy uh, care in one environment with uh, shared facilities, that is, we think, the way to go. What people have to realize is that um, you know, aging in the last 20 years, um, we, we have, you know, uh, age expectancy has, has progressed a lot. And, and, and the state, effectively, of dependency of uh, the residents uh, ha has really changed a lot. And, and, uh, and so, if you are 20 years ago, you, you had a, a sort of one size fits all. Again, we're talking a specific branch of healthcare sector, not clinic, just talking on the senior. So one size fits all where you had, you know, dependent and uh, less dependent and a bit more dependent in a kind of, a, you know, home um, for seniors. And, and, and what we have seen in the last 20 years is, you know, much more specialization into the nursing home, which has is become more and more really, as, as uh, uh, was just uh, said now, you know, this much shorter time, uh, average uh, length of time of, of stay. Uh, 24 months uh, and, and and very dependent people and so this has sort of enabled um, or created a lack of, of, of uh, proposal for this this type of, of uh, assisted living um, uh, places and depending on the countries um, uh, you know yes you had some you know owner occupied um, models etc etc but now I think uh, it has started in France it has started in Germany much less in Italy, uh, a bit more maybe in some places in, in, in the UK, etc. You have this form of, of assisted living with operator, you know, uh, taking a master lease and, and really, you know, looking at it from an operator perspective and care, caring, taking care of, of this population that is not very dependent, more or less the same age, about 80 to 85 people entering, 85, sorry, uh, uh, years old. Uh, entering these facilities, but um, less dependent than you know the, the ones in the nursing homes, and 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 this is the growth, big growth of the market in in France. We have now 600 um, uh, uh, facilities like that in 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 France. Uh, in Germany, it's also starting quite quite uh, rapidly, and I think this is going to be, you know. Uh, the big growth of the sector. Of course, you will still have a uh, nursing home caring for that that fringe of population for the last 24 months of, of, of our lives. But but you have will have the uh, the sort of um, uh, assisted living and also some form of home care uh, models um, developing very rapidly. And we actually you know going to come out uh, just a little advertising uh, with a report on on the French assisted living sector in in the in the next in the coming weeks. And, and 
looking at, at, at all the European markets. Okay, so I'm going to come back to that, that assisted living um, senior housing side in a minute. Um, but Keith, I just wanted to pick up with you, um, looking at the sort of more medical facilities, um, how do you see that market in, in comparison, um, whether that's doctors or hospital facilities, those kinds of things? How do you, how do you see that and, and how do you quantify that um, in terms of a sort of overall sector, looking at, looking at senior housing in comparison to the more medical facilities? In Holland, well, the, the medical office building sector is uh, growing rapidly, but will still be a far smaller segment than the, the senior housing segment, if, if, if that's your question. Um, the medical office building sec segment is, is very interesting. We see um, large, large demand for that. It has its own specifics. Um, we've seen in the, in the current crisis that um, as Certain groups of people are more vulnerable to, uh, to the, the, the impact of the pandemic of, of, of COVID than, than others. Um, a significant amount of people had to stop uh, working when uh, the crisis hit uh, the, the, the sector. But all in all, it, what I said before, it's very resilient, and with all the government support, uh, it turns out to be a very interesting uh, investment segment. Um, clinics and things like that, hospitals. Hospitals are still quite a difficult uh, area to invest, mainly because of all the regulatory issues you have there. You're never really certain about what's going to happen. In the more private clinic side, there we see a lot of, uh, of opportunities already in that business and also uh, trying to expand there. What do you think about the primary care uh, case? Because I think, agree with uh, Geert, uh, you mentioned already that we do a lot more outpatient care, so not, not going to a hospital for uh, a small uh, incision or uh, so we, we will do it in the more general practitioner's uh, environment. So I think the primary care business will also grow and uh, also we make more and more combinations with senior living. So primary care uh, on the first level and senior living on top. I think we will, we will make more mixed use development. In the, in the I absolutely agree with that because the hospital environment is uh, usually very expensive, you know, a lot of reg regulation around it. So you will see uh, less and less uh, hospital space and more primary care. I, f I fully agree with that. Okay, good. Um, and um, Keith, from, from your perspective um, at CBRE, what's What's your what's your sense of that? Um, how how uh, I suppose how do you see the investor appetite uh, for medical facilities versus senior care? W what's the capital What's the capital looking at? Because um, uh, uh, I understand as well that you've been working with quite a lot of US capital lately. Yeah, that's true. I mean, medic medical facilities and senior care are two sides of the same coin. Um, because the, the vast, uh, the vast uh, increase in requirement for medical care is from elderly people. So the medical care is, is trying to keep them out of care homes and keep them out of institutional care. Um, but when, they, when their acuity or their care needs get to a point where they no longer uh, function uh, on their own and they need to help with um, getting up and dressing and, and eating and bathing and so forth, then then that's, that's when they really do need a care home uh, environment. So, so medical facilities, the, the, the demographic changes uh, remain uh, as much as an imperative for, for medical office buildings, doctor's surgeries, clinics, diagnostics, etc., as they do in the care home sector. Um, there, there is nonetheless change coming. It's change brought about by technology. Um, increasing use of, uh, of pharmacies and, and practice nurses in, in, uh, in GP surgeries. Um, so the overall, uh, the overall requirement of, of medical office buildings uh, is, is changing, but the requirement is increasing. And, and you know, with technology, which, which we, can, you know, we can have uh, appointments on our iPhones with, with doctors and so forth, that works for people who are good with iPhones, um, and I almost am, but but for elderly, for the elderly population, they they need the reassurance and the, the, the human contact of a of a uh, of a doctor. Um, so there's going to continue to be a very very strong and increasing demand at the at the consumer level for these facilities, and that will feed through to investment. 
Okay, good. Um, I wanted to pick up a little bit. Um, of, uh, thanks very much to everybody who's who's voting at the moment in terms of resilience of each of those sectors. Um, and I'll share that with you in a minute. Um, I just wanted to come uh, to look a little bit at, at locations. Um, in terms of, I, I suppose, opportunities, um, there's some questions coming in around Poland as well as CE and different areas. Um, what's everybody's sense of of, of where they see the opportunities at the moment. And that's irrespective of, I suppose, of, of whether or not you're active in those markets at the moment. Um, but where do we think geographically are, are they, you know, the U is it the big three of Germany, UK, France? Uh, is it the Nordics? Is it, there was a question also about Spain and Iberia, Benelux. Um, what, what's your sense of that? Uh, who wants to pick that up? The bigger markets are, are, the, are the attractive locations for the big, uh, for the very big investors because you can get the larger size transactions. Um, it's absolutely the case that Portugal and Spain have, have well-established uh, senior living markets, Italy as well, um, Benelux, again, Belgium has got very sophisticated uh, care home infrastructure. It's slightly on the change in the Netherlands. The Nordics is dominated by state provision and so there's there's less of a investable market there but there is an investable market and one or two of the Nordic funds have done very well people like Northern Horizons and, and Equitix in building up very good portfolios in the Nordics um, so, so it, it's it's really difficult to answer generically it's a very very big topic if I may just uh, a quick word I mean it, it, it's hard to answer, I agree. Uh, and then, of course, it depends what you mean by opportunity. I think maybe the answer, and it goes to the association, maybe the answer is that, is that Europe is actually the, 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 you know, the, the right place to be because you would have, um, and you have to be diversified. And, and, and also that goes back to your, your question about how do we become you know, the American market. Uh, I think we become the Amer American market uh, by becoming more European and, and the likes of uh, Cofinimo, of course, and Edifica, um, and, and what we are trying to do is, 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 is that, is, is really to look at the European market um, as, as a whole. And, and, uh, and you have mature markets like France and, 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 and Germany, large and mature markets, but of course with uh, lower yields. And you have more uh, growing opportunistic maybe uh, uh, markets like uh, as was mentioned uh, Spain, Italy, um, Portugal, um, um, Ireland uh, and, and, and some markets that are quite established but maybe with, with, with uh, more independent operators and this would be the kind of the Netherlands. Uh, so you know you, and of course and then you have the UK but the UK is a little bit original uh, or different, uh, I would say, because of the currency, because of, 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 of the history of the, of the sector there. So by, by having this sort of diversif diversified approach, I think you, you, you can uh, compose a quite a, a nice um, uh, portfolio, um, you know, that, that will balance uh, yield, um, long-term uh, resilience and, 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 and growth. Okay, good. Um, just a just a final round, and then um, just for everybody, uh, this is a. I'll, I'll pick up this question just on trends with everybody, um, and then after that, um, we'll have a we'll run through some of the questions that we haven't dealt with yet in a sort of less formal um, kind of function, so that then we'll try to pick up the things that that there've been. Um, but just on this one, um, and let's let's start with you, Ron, for this round, which is um, so given that you know most of the discussions that i've been having across all sectors and themes have been talking about an accelerator effect um that the crisis has had um just so just in terms of that um given the current trends where do you see the opportunities at the moment um and i'll also pick that up with everybody so at the moment where, where do you see the the opportunities in in the sector look at aging demographics so where are the the big numbers uh, I think we will see a lot of consolidation, but also uh, more and more sale and lease back opportunities. So I think um, um, operators will focus on their core business. So they will focus on the, on the long-term care side and maybe being owner of your real estate isn't that important. So 
I think uh, there will be a, some sort of shakeout of all the real estate assets towards investors or uh, third parties. Um, so I, th I think, think there will be more and more portfolio deals, uh, also with size. Um, yeah, so I think in general that will be my, my answer. Uh, and I totally agree with Frederick. Uh, he was uh, telling uh, before that you should focus on the European level. So don't, don't be too narrowed in terms of your scope. I think healthcare and also senior living, senior housing needs uh, diversification, but also being a smart and active manager because don't, don't focus only on a, on, a, on a leasing contract, like a triple net lease contract for 25 years. Mm -hmm. I think uh, you have mm -hmm. to look, for example, to the senior housing market as an individual rent market. And uh, in, in general, I think it's about affordability. So people are willing to pay like between 700 and 1100 euros per month. Uh, and, and don't focus on the happy few who can allow like 3,000 all in. So uh, that's also about uh, uh, looking at the numbers. Where's the biggest demand? And that's also uh, about the affordability. Uh, All we we'll see in Europe is, of course, a consolidation of operators going on. That is a trend that will uh, go forward. And I think uh, one of the, the things where you should be is uh, in partnerships with those operators. Uh, we've seen now with uh, this, uh, this pandemic that um, scale matters, uh, size matters in, uh, in, in healthcare real estate. So when you go with the big operators, I think you are in the right um, uh, in the right corner. That's one. Another segment that we think is very interesting is uh, mental health care. I think Ron already mentioned the, the the number of people with dementia doubling, for example, in the Netherlands between now and 2040. Huge demand, um, a, a lot of uh, need for, for additional facilities. So that's uh, in, in sort of where, where we are. Okay, great. Yes. Well, I don't think, I think we should not underestimate the number of trends. I think the demographics over the, the entire uh, landscape in Europe is more or less the same. I think there is also uh, an abundance of private money available for the infrastructure and I don't think the governments are going to cut back on spending on, on care but I think we should not underestimate the expectations of the new generation coming into elderly care homes the, the baby boom generation as far as uh, the luxury of the environment is concerned I think we also should not underestimate the need for technology in the infrastructure uh, of the elderly care of the senior housing um, in the, the future and the need for flexible buildings. That's what Corona proved as well, that we need to think about flexibility in infrastructure so that we, when the next crisis occurs and the pandemic uh, situation occurs, that we can shift more easily within these, these buildings. So don't underestimate these trends, but if you stick to these trends, if you have a response, an answer to these trends, I think you, you have an, a number of nice possibilities of investments in uh, senior housing. Okay, great. And lastly, Frederick. It was, it was said before, uh, nursing home, consolidation in nursing home um, is, is really uh, the opportunity. And so you have, for this, you have to look at the non-consolidated markets and, and that's Italy, uh, Spain, um, Ireland, Ireland, Netherlands. Um, and of course, to some extent, Germany, it's a very large market. Consolidation has started, but it's still happening. France is kind of, done so so it's it would be less uh, france and then uh, i think the big wave is is uh, we've said it is is uh, assisted living across europe um, and that will require a lot of, of investment in the in the in the coming years um, and and when i mean when i say assisted living it's going to be you know assisted living as we know it but also some some you know um, diverse diversified forms of assisted living either in, in smaller you know smaller scale or larger scale or you know communities i mean you will have in the coming uh, years i think uh, a diversification of, of and of, of offer of services of an, an offer of uh, of residence uh, for for the for the seniors because i think we we uh, shouldn't be blind also for uh, countries like or actually regions the ce region 
or uh, Poland as a country, because I think uh, once I, I gave a, a keynote in the Baltics, well, I think the Baltics are a, a great example of a country who is very smart and eager to, in, to speed up uh, also the, the professional side of the healthcare system. So, but that's always the question for the investor, uh, am I focused on size, so uh, size in terms of deal flow, portfolio deals, etc., or am I also looking at diversification in terms of geography, uh, etc.? So, um, but I think every country has its own unique characters and also investment uh, possibilities. Uh, so um, that's one uh, additional uh, uh, remark from my side. Okay, good. Um, so uh, just to just to share the the last two polls, which was, do you see the following sectors as resilient in terms of investment? Uh, senior housing, light touch, came out top at 70%. Senior housing, care homes, came out at 55%. And medical facilities came out at 48%. Um, and just in terms of the, the sort of locations, the poll that we did came out as which locations are the most attractive for investment. Uh, UK was on 32%, Germany 48% out in front, France 29%, Benelux 27%. Nordic 17%, Iberia 44%, so that's a good answer for, for the question that came in from Spain. Uh, Italy 29% and CE at 16%. Um, so interesting spread there uh, across um, uh, across Europe, I think. The next events that we've got coming up are on the 16th of June. We'll be focused on the future of office. On the 18th of June, um, we'll be focused on data and prop tech. Thank you for joining us today. Look forward to seeing you at the next one. Um, and uh, do, in the meantime, stay safe and stay well. Look forward to seeing you at the next one. Thanks very much, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.